Chapter 1. Consensus Process Group meetings. Trying to change the world often means engaging in tedious work, but even so, meetings tend to be more painful experiences than they need to be. People who attend the consensus meeting and come away with a bad impression frequently report one of two complaints. Sometimes they feel like they have entered a tight-knit social club with rules that are secret and inscrutable, and power dynamics that are cliquish and impenetrable. At other times, newcomers get the impression that a particular consensus-based group is hyper-organized to the point of inefficiency, and almost bureaucratic in its rules and procedures. Both extremes are disempowering, but unlike authoritarian organizations or governments, for which public meetings simply provide a rubber stamp to the decisions already made behind closed doors, Consensus-based groups need meetings to organize group activities openly and fairly. People cannot be empowered members of the group if they do not know how to effectively participate in meetings. A shared understanding of how the meetings are to run will help keep everyone on equal footing. Structure and Structurelessness One of the hardest skills in consensus decision-making is knowing when to be formal and when to be informal, and how to transition between the two. Structureless groups are likely to turn into social cliques, with informal leaders perpetuating many of the same power dynamics we are fighting against in society at large. On the other hand, groups that are too heavily structured can be inefficient, heavy-handed, and unwelcoming to outsiders. Finding a comfortable middle ground for your group can require a constant effort. Often, groups will be flexible, using different levels of organization and different processes at different times. Many consensus-based groups that meet regularly will spend most of their meetings discussing topics that only require simple decisions, or no decisions at all. Sharing updates about an ongoing campaign, announcing upcoming events, deciding if you want to host a particular workshop at your radical communi community space, organizing publicly for an event, Many conversations take place informally, without an explicit process. Group decisions that require a more formal process, such as solving problems and deciding strategies and actions, will probably come up less frequently, but are of huge importance. These types of discussions in particular are difficult, both in their own right and because of our upbringing in an authoritarian society that rarely lets us make such decisions. Discussion Process Who has not had the excruciating experience of sitting through meetings in which discussion goes through endless, tail-biting circles with no progress or development? A decision implies both a question and a resolution. Therefore, the principal effort of effective discussion goes from general to specific, from inquiry to explanation to suggestion to solution. You can't come up with a solution before you know what the problem is. You can't come up with a good solution until all the relevant questions have been answered and group members have the information they need. First, a group needs to express the problem. Doing this clearly and plainly can help everyone focus on the problem and begin to think strategically. Second, those who lack important information need to ask questions and to receive answers. Then, it is important, before talking about specific actions in response to the problem, to define success. What does the group want or hope to accomplish? What is the best solution to the problem at hand, and what is an acceptable intermediate solution? For complex or difficult problems, it can help to identify primary and secondary goals, long-term and short-term goals, ideal goals, and compromise goals. Only after all these steps have been articulated will it be useful to talk about and decide specific actions the group can take in response to the problem. Again, in discussing tactics, people should proceed from general to specific. Don't start working out the logistical details of a tactic until you've made sure group members approve of the tactic and have decided that the tactic will help achieve the group's chosen strategy. 
to properly consider the tactical questions in front of you, you may need to ask clarifying questions about one individual option, or even establish if, if it is logistically possible. But don't get tied up in unnecessary specifics until you have defined the options, and then agreed as a group on a definite choice. One of the ways unscrupulous people pushing their own agenda can manipulate consensus process is by getting the group to delve into the details of a specific decision before that decision has been consensed on. In such cases, the people in your group will soon be too involved in formulating a certain course of action to remember that they were considering several other courses of action as well. Although real discussions are fluid and organic, Thinking of the discussion as something that unfolds in stages can help your group openly and effectively consider all options and prevent you from getting sidetracked. Note: Work out a general framework before dealing with specific details of any one element of that framework. Express the problem. Ask questions. Answer those questions. Define success. Decide specific actions. Decision-making process. It's helpful to have a clear outline or flowchart of how decisions will be made in your group. Few things are more frustrating than to have a long discussion on a problem only to find at the next meeting that some group members think a decision has been made and others do not. Often, this happens when some group members are more vocal than others and interpret the others' silence as agreement. This brings up the problem of leadership. In a hierarchical society, an informal decision-making process allows informal leadership. Although informal leadership may be more flexible than formalized leadership, it is also less accountable because it exists behind a facade of equality. Worse, it can and will accentuate unique power dynamics already existing in the group. How can we avoid this? To start out, the group as a whole formulates an agenda, and proceeding item by item, shares the information at hand, discusses the topic with an eye to expressing goals and agreeing on a strategy, proposes a solution, reviews the proposal, and decides on the proposal. It repeats these steps for each new topic, until all agenda items are dealt with and the meeting is over. As long as all group members are made aware of this process, they will know exactly how decisions are made and can participate. Making decisions in this way does not require attending secret meetings, paying membership dues, knowing and being friends with the inner core of influential group members, or being able to talk more loudly or articulately than others. If would-be leaders attempt to manipulate or disregard an open and visible process, their actions will be more apparent than if they tried to do the same in a closed, informal, or hidden process. Agenda An agenda is simply a list of what your group will talk about at a meeting. Anyone who is a group member should be able to add a topic of discussion to the agenda. Naturally, the group should come up with an agenda at the very beginning of a meeting, if not before. Some people like to draw up the agenda before the meeting, so group members can decide how important their participation at that meeting will be, and start preparing for the discussions in advance. However, making the agenda in advance usually means that a handful of more involved group members create the agenda with little or no input from less involved members. This can, and often does, aggravate the problem of inequality within a group. A good compromise is to create and publicize a preliminary agenda before the meeting, and then rewrite the agenda with new suggestions at the beginning of the meeting. A good way to generate a preliminary agenda is, at the end of a meeting, for the group as a whole to make a list of unresolved business to discuss at the next meeting. The preliminary agenda is then passed around by email, telephone, word of mouth, or however the group communicates. Finally, it's modified at the start of the next meeting. At that next meeting, the preliminary agenda should be made visible by putting it on a poster or chalkboard so that it can be easily modified. 
After your group decides on a final agenda, the agenda should also be posted so that during the meeting, everyone can see where the group is and how much remains to be done. Some agenda items will be problems that require decisions. These are the hardest and will receive the most attention in this manual. But other agenda items do not require substantial discussion and decision. These include announcements, fundraiser at so-and-so's house, complex announcements that require more question and answer before everyone fully understands, there's a big protest in New York, this is what's happening, routine decisions with limited, well-established outcomes, where are we going to have our next meeting, and autonomous actions that simply need the group's yay or nay. I'm organizing a radical movie night, and I want to know if I can do it in the group's name. If the meeting is expected to be easy or routine, the order of agenda items can be left in the random order in which group members shout them out, as someone writes them down. However, if the meeting might be difficult, it can help to order the agenda items in a strategic way. Don't leave the difficult topics for the end, or everyone will be too tired or frustrated to discuss them effectively. Start out with an easy de decision to get people warmed up for the hard ones. If you have more than one difficult topic, it helps to break them up with easy topics or other activities. Announcements usually work best at the, at the beginning of a meeting. Tedious discussion topics should not be scheduled at the beginning of a meeting, when people tend to be long-winded, but such topics also should not be at the end, when no one will have the energy to deal with them. Decisions that are not urgent and can be put off for another meeting should go towards the end of the meeting, so that if the group runs out of time, you will at least have covered the topics of immediate importance. Discussion the group should discuss one agenda item at a time until everyone agrees to go on to the next topic. Each time the group turns to a specific agenda item, the person who suggested the topic or the people who know most about it should give a quick background so everyone knows what is being discussed. Then everyone who knows something about the topic should go around and share information until all the general relevant information has been covered. Depending on how much time the group has to talk about this agenda item, you may also bring up specific details, or instead, mention resources where people can research the important details on their own. Remember, relevance is important. No one wants to sit through a long meeting, so thoroughness should be balanced with conciseness. As people volunteer information, group members should also ask questions until they are satisfied that they know enough to proceed. You don't have to be an expert on the topic at hand just competent to discuss it. Next, the group needs to decide its goals. The more diverse the group members are in their politics, visions, and worldviews, the more difficult it will be to agree on a goal. There sometimes comes a point when it is no longer effective for people to be working together in a group because their desires are irreconcilable. For example, do we just want to raise awareness or stop these trees from being cut down? Do we want to push the government to accept more public input and accountability in making logging decisions? Or do we want to empower people to take direct action to physically prevent the logging? It is almost normal in our alienated culture for people to put substantial energies into a campaign without ever defining success. Once you have a goal, you need to decide upon a strategy to implement that goal. If a goal is a destination, a strategy is the path to reach that destination. We will raise awareness by teaching people the importance and uniqueness of this forest ecosystem, by showing how corporations hold influence over the political process at the expense of the public. Or, alternately, we will stop these trees from being cut, using civil disobedience to obstruct the logging operations and raise the political costs incurred by the decision makers, using sabotage and harassment to, to disable logging machinery and equipment and to dissuade people from participating in the logging. If a group knows what its goal is and the group members have a consistent and shared morality, do they favor civic duty or autonomy, reform or revolution, the basic strategy will follow on its own. A more complex strategy will take more thought, but simplicity can increase a strategy's feasibility. 
Tactics are the concrete steps and actions that are carried out as part of a larger strategy. Putting out a pamphlet, organizing a demonstration, blockading a road, setting up a free clinic, all of these can be tactics within particular strategies. Too often, activists will carry out certain tactics, especially protests, as an empty habit or a ritual without understanding how that action will help achieve a goal, or even what that goal is. The point of a discussion is to make sure that everyone knows enough to address the topic strategically and then move from a general understanding towards making a specific plan. Usually, people will disagree about the best way to confront the problem at hand. Discussion allows group members to evaluate one another's thoughts, synthesize different ideas into a richer, more complete whole, and move towards a point of agreement that can be expressed as a concrete proposal. Some decision topics are simple enough that the progression from goal to strategy to tactic is self-evident, and the only points requiring group decision are the logistical specifics. For example, if a group member announces that the group is out of funds and there is a need for funds, and if neither of these bits of information are controversial, then the goal is quite obviously to raise some funds. And unless this group is the kind that engages in expropriations, you can skip discussion of strategy and go straight to talking about the tactic, what kind of fundraising event you want to organize. Other topics are complex enough that articulating the goal, strategy, and tactics are essential. Again, depending on the complexity of the issue, the group may be able to incorporate goal, strategy, and tactics all into one decision, or you may need to go through entirely separate discussions, proposals, and decisions for each step. Note, some tactics are complex and ambitious enough to become goals in their own right, requiring a new set of strategies and tactics to implement them successfully. Most things can be viewed as one of three, as a goal, a strategy, or a tactic, depending on whether it is looked at in the context of long-term goals, short-term goals, or immediate projects. Proposals a proposal is a clearly articulated plan put before the group as a possible solution to the problem you are discussing. Both the timing and content of the proposal are critical. Don't make a proposal too early in a discussion before all group members have gotten to speak their minds and consider the different ideas sufficiently. And also, don't wait until people have tired themselves out agreeing saying the same things over and over again. It's extremely important not to make a proposal when there are still serious disagreements, as this will only divide the group. The purpose is to synthesize everyone's wants and needs. Consensus is cooperative, not competitive like voting. With practice, you can begin to feel the perfect time for making a proposal. After disagreements have been discovered and amended, and group members are starting to agree on suggestions for a solution. Not every discussion will lead to a proposal. Sometimes it becomes apparent that group members need to learn more before they make a decision, and the topic should be put off for a future meeting. At other times, disagreements are too serious to allow an effective synthesis, and group members will need more time to consider their positions and think about new solutions. A good consensus process ensures that the group is not forced into making decisions before it is ready. If the group is ready to decide on a course of action, the proposal should be precise, inclusive, and fair. It needs to be stated clearly and ideally restated by someone else in the group, so everyone has the same understanding of the proposal. Too often, a group goes through all the effort of a consensus decision only to find that there are multiple, conflicting interpretations of the decision. The proposal also needs to include as many group members' wants, needs, and ideas as possible. It should be an expression of the agreements that culminate from the group discussion. 
Once a proposal has been made, group discussion has to focus on that proposal until it has been voted on or withdrawn. Changing the topic or making other proposals once a proposal is already on the table is distracting and makes progress difficult. Questions. The first step after someone makes a proposal is to ask clarifying questions, to make sure everyone has the same understanding of the proposal, and to confirm background information that can help group members assess whether the proposal is a good one. Concerns. After clarifying questions, group members should bring up concerns they have with the proposal at hand. Group discussion can help assess whether these concerns illuminate valid problems. Friendly amendments. If group members' concerns with the proposal are focused on a small detail or a larger component, but are not disagreements with the entire proposal itself, either the proposer or anyone else in the group can suggest a friendly amendment. A friendly amendment is a mild modification of the proposal to address people's concerns. If anyone disagrees with the friendly amendment, the proposal and any amendments need to undergo further discussion. Withdrawals. If it becomes obvious that a proposal, or a friendly amendment for that matter, has serious shortcomings or disapproval, the, proper, the proposer can withdraw it. A withdrawal means the proposal is no longer under discussion and the group can return to brainstorming a better proposal. The point of a proposal is to come up with a decision the whole group can own, and if it's clear that a number of other group members don't like your proposal, you should withdraw it. Voting. Once the proposal has been discussed to everyone's satisfaction and no one appears to be staunchly opposed to it, anyone can call a vote and as long as no one objects, the group should then vote. Someone should restate the proposal, especially if it has been amended or changed during the discussion, and field any last clarifying questions. Then you should ask if there are any blocks or any standasides, and then ask who is in favor. As with the proposal, timing is important in taking a vote. Don't call a vote if the room is tense or divided, and don't call a vote before everyone has gotten a chance to discuss the proposal fully. Blocks A block is a very powerful action, and one of the things that makes consensus unique. Any one person in the group can veto a decision. Just give a thumbs down during the vote, and the group cannot adopt that proposal. Consensus is based on voluntary association. You cannot be forced to be a member of a consensual group like you can be forced to be the subject of a democratic government. Because the rest of the group is associating with you by choice, they can't force you to do anything you don't want to do. And the group, with you as an integral part, cannot do anything you do not approve of. Because the block is a serious power, it comes with serious responsibilities. First, you have the responsibility to explain your reason for blocking the decision, and you have the responsibility to express your serious disagreement during the group discussion, before the proposal ever comes to a vote. If people are surprised when you block a decision, something did not happen the way it was supposed to. Because of the tremendous impact of a block, you shouldn't block unless you have a good reason. Consensus decision-making cannot exist in a competitive, individualistic culture. You shouldn't block a decision just because you didn't like the proposal or thought your idea was better. You should block a proposal when you think it is a bad thing for the group as a whole to do. Consider it this way. If your local cop watch group you want to publicize an instance of police brutality using a graffiti campaign, and everyone else wants to make flyers. The contradiction is simply a disagreement of preference. Ideally, your idea may be the better one, but practically, you should recognize your idea won't work out well if you're the only one who is enthusiastic about it. 
the critical question should be, what is best for the group to do? The group can't stop you from doing your graffiti campaign on your own time, as long as it's not in the group's name. And if you're not stoked about it, you don't have to help with the group's flyering campaign. The point is that a large enough majority of the group wants to do it that it can be an effective action. You certainly can't dictate to other people what is the best way for them to spend their time. On the other hand, if you feel like a proposed decision would hurt the group, hurt people in the group, alienate the group from its base of support, or something like that, it is your responsibility to block the decision. You should also block the decision if you think that people in the group have seriously or intentionally manipulated the process to silence disagreement or push their proposals through without legitimately addressing concerns. One person standing alone can halt the momentum of the other group members, who may have stopped considering other options simply because they're in the majority. Our society certainly teaches people that might makes right, an effective block can give the rest of the group time to think about the situation from other another angle. If someone does block a decision, the group then needs to discuss whether to go back to the drawing board and work out another proposal, or drop the topic at hand until another meeting, or for good. Some may call this a disadvantage, but I consider it one of the unique strengths of consensus decision-making. It allows the group to make no decision at all. With consensus, the highest priority is the health of the group, and allowing the group to not make a decision prevents minorities from having to go along with decisions they oppose. The failure to make a decision should not be stigmatized. It should be appreciated as a signal that the group needs to work more on finding common ground. In some cases, a healthy group using consensus will never have a block because group members communicate so well that no one will call a vote until all major disagreements have been worked out. On the flip side, other consensus groups never see anyone block a decision because less involved group members are afraid to cause an inconvenience or contradict the group's informal leaders. If, on the other hand, people repeatedly block decisions making it difficult for the group to accomplish anything, there are two possible problems. Perhaps certain members are still operating in an individualistic, competitive mode and need to be confronted with this fact so they can decide whether to improve their behavior or find a group that better fits their beliefs. Another possibility is that yours is simply not a feasible group. An effective group needs to have common ground and good reason to work together. Can different group members even agree on a common purpose for the group? If not, it's time for the group to break up and its members to form more effective groups with people of shared interests. Likewise, if you find yourself at odds with everyone else in your group in terms of morality and worldview, perhaps the group isn't the right one for you. Stand Asides If nobody blocks a decision, you should then see if anyone in the group chooses to stand aside. Signal a stand aside by putting your thumb out to the side, neither up nor down. If you personally don't feel like the proposal on the table represents the best decision or have other disagreements with parts of the proposal, but you still think it would be better for the group to use that proposal than to do nothing at all, you can stand aside. Also, if you don't care to support the plan of action, but you don't mind if other people do, you can stand aside. If anyone does indicate a stand aside during the vote, you should find out why. It's best to ask them if they feel like their concerns have been heard and addressed, and double check if they are okay with the group accepting the proposal. If one or two people stand aside and those people feel like their concerns have been treated fairly, you're doing fine. If a large portion of the group is standing aside, that's a good indication that more involved group members have pushed a decision through without the participation or support of everyone else. Thumbs up. Once you have asked if anyone blocks or stands aside, 
Even though that means that everyone else is technically in favor of the proposal, you should still go ahead and ask for thumbs up. Make sure that everyone votes one way or another. If you notice that someone did not vote, you ask why and give them the benefit of the doubt. Maybe they felt intimidated. If your consensus process is working well, you should know how everyone is going to vote before the vote is called. A major purpose of the vote is to allow formal group recognition of the proposal and to require every single group member to personally express what they feel about the proposal before the decision is made. In groups with informal leadership, in which a few more involved people do all the talking and decision-making while everyone else just sits and watches, the lack of enthusiasm and involvement by less involved group members will be obvious. Often, they won't even bother giving a thumbs up to indicate their approval. For a consensus decision to be really valid, an overwhelming majority should be actively in favor of the decision. If a substantial number of people are standing aside, you may want to bring this up after the vote and look towards improving group dynamics. No decision. If, after the end of discussion and voting, you don't have a decision, don't worry. It's not the end of the world. It just means that in this case, making no decision was the best option available. What do you do now? If some people still want to take action on the issue, they can proceed autonomously in smaller groups as long as they don't go behind anyone's back, use the group's name, or do anything that could be counterproductive to the group's other efforts. It's not a dictatorship. We don't have to to get all our actions approved by the Central Committee. But at the same time, it shouldn't be a competition, so don't do anything that will screw over your friends and allies. Decision. So the group has consensed on a decision. If it was a long and difficult process, everyone may feel stressed and worn out, but as long as the decision was made fairly, you should also feel accomplished and triumphant. But you're not done yet. Make sure to write down the decision that was consensed on and make the, these records available to everyone through group notes or notes sent out over an email list. It's important to remember and keep a clear record of what the group consensed on so you haven't gone through all that work for nothing. Why is consensus so difficult? Consensus is not inherently more difficult than other forms of group decision making. It's just a question of what we're used to. In this society, very few decisions are up to us. The economy, the government, the media, schools and universities are all managed from above by secretive, exclusive groups of experts and specialists. The vast majority of decisions that are left up to us, mostly simple leisure and consumer choices, are highly individualistic and don't require any group process. Problem-solving is mostly monopolized by the government, through courts, cops, politicians, and social workers. Situations in which people do exist as part of a group are usually mediated by the government or some other hierarchy. There is always a boss, always a leader, always someone in charge, except in a few private settings like interactions with friends. In a society that treats us like incompetent, antisocial citizens, consumers, employees, our social skills atrophy like an unused muscle. Acting once again like competent social beings requires a lot of tiring exercise. Rather than following orders or giving orders, in consensus, you're forming voluntary groups to decide new and flexible ways of organizing your lives and harmonizing your activities so that everyone's needs can be met in a matter of their choosing. With enough practice, though, consensus begins to feel like second nature, considering how empowering it can be to work with others as equals and begin reclaiming control of all the commodified, co-opted aspects of your life. The effort is well worth it. Note, your group does not need to formally consent on every decision. Some decisions can be made informally without going through the whole voting process. The group has to make many minor decisions throughout the discussion itself as you proceed toward consensus. For example, 
Everyone has to agree whether they're ready to vote on a proposal, but it would be horribly inefficient to hold a vote on whether people are ready to vote on a proposal. Routine decisions, like when to hold the next meeting, can also do without full process. A good rule of thumb is this. If a decision is minor enough that the length of discussion will probably not take longer than going through a vote, then just consents informally by making a suggestion, looking for approval, asking if there are any objections, and moving along. If an issue is complex or controversial enough that the discussion will definitely take longer than the process of making a proposal and voting on it, it makes sense to use a formal, explicit consensus process. Otherwise, you may have to do it all over again if it turns out that there were objections or conflicting understandings of the informal decision.